Hello and welcome to the course Basic Cognitive Processes. I am Dr. Ark Parma from IIT Kanpur. Today we will be talking about the link between perception and action. You have seen till now that we have studied visual perception in a lot of detail. We have seen different aspects of perception, the theoretical issues and we have also seen in one of the most recent lectures about how visual perception helps us recognize and interact with objects in the uh, environment, in the real world. We are trying to uh, now go towards a position where we try and say that perception is not really a passive process, perception is almost an active process and basically it changes uh, the way we interact with the environment and that is basically the approach uh, what J.J. Uh, Gibson uh, took uh, if you remember that we talked about the ecological uh, approach to perception uh, and that ecological approach to perception was basically about the fact that uh, perception is not a passive process, perception is about interacting with the environment and the influence of uh, perception uh, and action is something that is of interest uh, to uh, people who study perception. Now, the theoretical background as I said is of J.J. Gibson's ecological approach to perception. He believed that perceptions to, uh, should be studied as people move through the environment and interact with it. So, his idea was that perception is not really a static thing, you are not sitting or standing at somewhere in a stationary manner and then looking and interacting with and then looking at the environment around you, uh, you are uh, more often than not moving uh, around in the environment, you are changing your position uh, with respect to you are changing your head position, you are changing your body position and with that change with that aspect of dynamicity, uh, the perception that you are receiving, the sensory input that you are receiving is also changing accordingly. So, that is a brief background with which uh, J. J. Gibson's approach to perception uh, was uh, stanced and uh, we have studied that in enough detail. Uh, just to uh, add to whatever we uh, know already or just to remind you, uh, I will just uh, say that the ecological approach to perception is basically focused itself on moving observers. So, it it is designed in such a way that it is about not stationary observers and how they look at the environment, but moving observers and how that movement information uh, influences their perception of the environment. This was basically uh, a very important concept uh, in Gibson's approach to perception was the concept of optic flow. Uh, if you remember optic flow is basically uh, the information about our movements in the environment and uh, the aspects in the environment. Say for example, uh, if you remember I talked about the moving train example and how a driver uh, looks out of the train and he sees uh, cows grazing in the field, how the movement of the train uh, affects the perception of those cows uh, which are grazing next to uh, you know the train in the field. So, those kind of things, uh, things about direction of movement, speed of movement, relative distance between the two moving objects, these kind of things figured as very prominent uh, you know sources of information in Gibson's approach to perception and that is what we will be building upon in today's uh, lecture in trying to make a link between perception and action. Optic flow basically is supposed to be rather fast near the observer the, who is moving and it becomes slower as uh, you move further away from this observer. So, this uh, difference in the intensity of optic flow is referred to as gradient of flow. This is a very important source of information. The other important source of information is basically the focus of expansion. If you remember, uh, I took uh, an example of a person uh, you know standing in front of the train and it is moving with the direction of the train. Uh, in that sense, there will be a small point uh, in uh, much further away from the moving train in the direction uh, that the train is moving uh, and that point will be the point uh, which is called the focus of expansion. So, it seems that the flow is emanating from that point, but that point itself has no uh, optic flow at all. So, that is a point where there is no optic flow, but all the optic flow is emanating from that direction. That point is called the focus of expansion. I have a figure here to show you that. Uh, the figure is from Goldstein's book of sensation and perception. You can see that if you are moving in a particular direction, uh, you can see that you know at that point in the center there is no flow, but flow is actually emanating from that direction. So, this is what the focus of expansion is. Uh, here and you can see the focus of expansion in the reference to a plane which is landing on an airstrip and you can see again uh, the center point when there is no flow uh, present at all, but all the flow is emanating from the sides of those points. 
Now, another uh, important aspect of the ecological approach to perception is the aspect of invariant information. Now, what is the invariant information? Invariant information is that information which does not change with respect to the movement of the observer. Till now, we have been talking about that the uh, observer moves around in the environment, this causes changes in the uh, perception and that information that changes in perception in terms of optic flow or focus of expansion give some very useful information to the observer uh, in order to continue his movements or in order to continue his exploration of the environment. There is however, part of information that does not really change uh, whether the observer is moving or not and this information is referred to as invariant information. As soon as the observer stops moving around the environment, there is no flow information there because flow is contingent to movement. The focus of expansion also shifts as soon as the observer changes its direction or it stops moving. So, these are the two sources of information uh, you will see that the, the observers use in order to interact successfully with the environment. So, how does this work? Uh, if I am moving in the environment, I will be creating something called self produced information. My movement in the environment will create some perceptual information that will help me continue moving and interacting with the environment. If a person is moving along the street, uh, you know say for example, imagine yourself driving a car in a particular busy street, uh, while you are driving uh, the relative distance the uh, direction of your movement and the speed with which you are moving will change a lot of information about say for example, if there is a food stall somewhere nearby to your left or to your right, if you uh, you know the kind of turn uh, that you are going to approach or with respect to your, uh, the relative size of the people that are in a particular distance, those kind of informations do change when you are moving. Okay. So, what you are doing here is you are actually uh, producing some information, some new information that is being used by the perceptual system, but this new information is actually being produced by your movement itself. And as you change the direction of movement, speed of movement, say for example, whether you are uh, stopping uh, altogether at all, uh, these kind of things uh, will basically you know be uh, useful uh, uh, for you to plan how you are going to move further. So, this information is, is very important. Uh, here in you can see a demonstration again from Goldstein sensation and perception that the movement of the car creates flow information. The flow information provides information for guiding further movement. If say for example, you are moving very fast towards a particular obstacle or say for example, there is a person crossing the road and you also uh, immediately turned on the road, you will see that the size of the person on your uh, retina uh, simply kind of is changing with the distance it is changing very fast with respect to whatever speed with you are, which, which uh, you are approaching that person. So, these are some of the kinds of information that people have reasoned uh, are uh, dynamically and almost always used by our perceptual systems. You can see that in that sense perception uh, is not really a static process, it is something that is changing uh, every moment and uh, whatever new information is produced by this uh, change that is happening every moment also is already taken into account before you plan your next movement. Uh, also Gibson said one of the things that the senses work in, in communion with each other, the senses work together to create this new perceptual information that you would use in order to move successfully. Imagine an animal who is hunting in the wild. Uh, he is basically moving, he is also using the sense of smell, he is also using his uh, sense of hearing, all of that to plan his movement in order to you know chase the prey successfully. Gibson actually produced that the five senses of vision, hearing, taste, smell and touch, they work together to produce information that actually facilitate moving around and interacting with the environment. Uh, another uh, nice example that uh, one can take is say for example, our ability to stand upright and maintain balance of posture uh, is basically dependent on uh, you know these uh, organs in the ear called the vestibular canals in the inner ear. We will talk about these when you are talking about auditory perception. Uh, these uh, vestibular canals are uh, is a kind of a canal like structure wherein some liquid is filled. Uh, position of this liquid tells you that the head is in balance or it is not in balance. So, this whole ability of you know standing is not really only uh, dependent on your touch or on your vision, it is also dependent on something that is going on in your ears. So, in that sense you can already say 
that we are using multiple sources of information to maintain our balance. A very interesting experiment uh, of, on this account was done by Lee and Aronson uh, in 1974. They actually designed what was called the swinging room experiment. So, uh, they had a false room wherein uh, toddlers and uh, young, uh, very young children could stand and the walls of this room could sometimes move closer to these uh, people or sometimes move further away or sometimes the room would swing uh, and this kind of created a perception of movement and what was observed that uh, uh, the sight of vision is actually found to be the more powerful uh, source of information in order to maintain somebody's balance and the sight of uh, and this uh, information from vision that is getting uh, that the people were getting can also sometimes override other traditional sources of information like the vestibular canal. So, what was happening was that when uh, people saw the walls coming toward themselves, they tried to uh, move backwards or uh, they tried to compensate for that movement of the wall. Uh, even though there was no signal that the, they are going off balance from the vestibular canal system. So, in that sense, it was adequately established that you know the sense of vision has to do a lot uh, with function like standing upright and you know standing straight and maintaining a particular body balance. Now, uh, we will take up some examples which uh, can be examples about how people, you know, uh, how people's perceptual systems uh, help them interact with the environment around them. We will take some naturalistic settings, say for example, the setting of driving a car. So, Land and Lee in 1994, they wanted to study the information that people use while they are driving a car. So, uh, what they did is they fitted a car with devices to record the angle of the steering wheel uh, and also uh, the speed and they also measured where this driver was looking uh, while uh, you know he is driving. So, with the help of a video eye tracker, they actually uh, fitted uh, a particular car with all of these gadgets and asked somebody to drive this car. And uh, when they did this experiment, when uh, some trials were done, they actually found out that although driving drivers do look straight ahead while driving, they are not re really looking at the uh, exact spot of the focus of expansion that uh, you know Gibson uh, kind of talks about. They are looking uh, not directly at the uh, uh, FOE, they are looking at a uh, point just adjacent to the FOE still in front of the car. So, in that sense, they are not really using optic flow information per se, but they are using some information from the outside environment to drive the car better, let us say. Uh, here you can see uh, one of the demonstrations uh, from uh, Goldstein. So, they are not really see uh, looking at the focus of expansion, they are looking at a point adjacent to the focus of expansion. Now, Landon Lee also wanted to study uh, where drivers were looking while they were navigating a curved road. So, this was important because when you are actually navigating a curved road, uh, the focus of expansion is uh, continuously changing. So, it has to be directly uh, right in front of you, but as you are changing your direction while navigating a curve, uh, the focus of expansion is also changing and so flow information is also changing. So, Land and Lee were interested in this and they found out that when going around a curve, the drivers do, are not really looking directly at the road, but they are actually focusing at the tangent point on the curve of the side of the So, they basically want to, uh, you know, uh, stay on the road by looking at the tangent point and not really directly at the road. Okay. So, as the drivers were not really looking directly at the focus of uh, expansion, Land and Lee suggested that drivers are using information in addition to the optic flow information that Gibson had specified in order to uh, determine the direction of movement. Uh, and this information could be anything, uh, you know, something very simple like for example, the position of the car with respect to the lines on the center or the side of the road. So, this is again, uh, you know, something that tells us that, you know, people are actively engaging with the environment in order to uh, successfully move around and navigate with the environment. They are taking up uh, new sources of information in addition to obviously the traditional source of information in order to, uh, uh, you know, uh, maintain this dynamicity of interaction. Uh, so, here you can see that, uh, you know, people are actually looking at the tangent point of the curve and not really the, you know, uh, the line at the center of the road, okay. Now, another uh, aspect that we use uh, perception in is uh, in walking. So, people walk uh, and uh, they navigate the environment successfully. Uh, what is the kind of information they might be using here? So, it is believed that they are probably following something called a visual direction strategy. So, what they are doing is they are keeping their bodies uh, pointed towards a particular target. See, for example, if you are walking on a straight road, you might, you know, kind of uh, position your body such that end of the road is your target and you are kind of walking in reference to that target. 
So, if they would go off in direction say for example, sometimes uh, while walking if you are talking to somebody uh, or if you are kind of thinking about something else or maybe texting nowadays, you might kind of go off direction and so the target would shift to the left or the right of where it was originally and this information helps us to uh, do what is called course correction. So, we think achha, now we have got off road and we have to come back and then uh, you know uh, maintain that uh, position with respect to the target that we have set up. So, Loomis and colleagues they basically wanted to test in a you know series of experiments uh, and they demonstrated this by making participants blind walk towards a target uh, that people uh, are able to walk directly towards a target and they kind of reach very close uh, towards it. So, for example, if you kind of tell somebody that there, this is your target and you have to walk towards this target and then kind of blindfold them, they will still reach rather close, uh, very close to the target without even using the visual information because they have oriented themselves uh, relative to that. So, here you can see a demonstration from Goldstein's book uh, that uh, the target is this uh, square, uh, green square uh, uh, in the top and the person starts at a point uh, uh, slightly diagonal to that and uh, they are start walking towards points 1 or 2 and they can turn towards the uh, right uh, at either point 1 or uh, point 2 and they kind of you see in both those in uh, places uh, land somewhere very close to the target, they are not really off target by a lot. So, these set of experiments actually demonstrated uh, that people can orient themselves while walking uh, to a particular target and then might not be actively using a lot of visual information. They might kind of orient themselves in a different way. Wayfinding is also a very important. Somebody tells you that you know you have to reach there and meet me at this particular point and if you do not know the place, you will be navigating for a long distance towards an object that is not already in sight. Uh, the last example was when you already have an object in sight and you are kind of preparing to walk towards it. Uh, the other thing could be that you do not have an object in sight and you are kind of uh, navigating, making mental maps and moving towards that. Wayfinding in that sense is a slightly complex process that involves perception of objects in the environment, remembering those objects and their place in the overall scene and also judging when what direction to turn. Say for example, if you are remembering uh, you know how to reach uh, you know a particular theater or a particular coffee place from your home uh, and it is a place you, where you are going for the first time, you might want to remember what all uh, shops that you found in between if, uh, if there was a park or if there was an important building what we do generally is we kind of tell people that uh, that was that uh, you know that you will find this building and you can take a left or right from that particular building uh, and then reach this place if you're going alone as well you might use these strategies uh, almost subconsciously but automatically that you remember that uh, these are the pointers in the way of uh, you know my target and i'll remember them so that next time i can orient myself according to these uh, points uh, an important aspect of such uh, navigation is these points and these points are referred to as landmarks. So, we remember uh, these landmarks uh, say for example, from this particular building you have to turn uh, you know turn left or turn right. So, that particular bu building becomes a source of important information. It is uh, associated with that you have to turn left or right during while you are reaching a particular target. So, these are the objects on the route that serve as cues uh, to indicate where you have to turn, where you have to get off the road. So, uh, Sahar Hamid and colleagues in 2001, they studied the use of landmarks by participants as they were negotiating a maze-like environment presented on a computer screen and while pictures of common objects were used as uh, landmarks. So, they are actually in a simulated maze, they were basically taught to uh, reach from point A to point B in a maze and at different points in the maze, they use these uh, pictures of common objects as landmarks. So, they will know that achha, from this uh, object, I have to take a left to reach the end of the maze. So, there were two phases, participants were first trained to go through the maze and they were told to travel from point A to point B uh, in the maze. Uh, the, in the second part, they also monitored eye movements uh, using what is called a head mounted eye tracker. So, eye tracking measures indicated that participants spent more time looking at informative landmarks than uninformative landmarks. So, uh, those landmarks that actually provided useful information about turning and reaching the uh, target successfully were looked at much more, they were given much more importance. 
In a similar study by Shinazi and Epstein, it was shown that when subjects had learned a particular uh, route, they were more likely to recognize pictures of buildings at those decision points. So, you might say for example, remember that uh, that is a particular crossing from which I have to take a turn. So, you will remember how that crossing looks, what are the important shops or posters on that crossing. Similarly, the participants in this uh, study also remembered pictures uh, of uh, landmarks uh, at those particular uh, pictures at those particular landmarks that were informative uh, for reaching towards a particular target. Also, uh, when uh, these participants were taken in an fMRI scanner, it was found that the brain responses in the navigational areas of the brain, which are like the uh, parahippocampal gyrus, hippocampal gyrus and the retrospinal cortex, the responses of uh, these particular brain areas was much larger to these informative landmarks than to non-informative uh, landmarks or non-decision building points. So, this kind of tells us that the brain is constantly keeping track of wherein we are interacting with the environment, what are the sources of important information, so that it can plan and it can be prepared for action, for navigation, for moving around the environment. You are seeing that you know we are not just following instructions, even if somebody gives you a map and says that you reach from point A to point B uh, and you kind of you know follow these steps, uh, you are obviously all the time gaining much more information by really taking uh, the car or your cycle or walking around that road. Uh, here is this uh, e example of the brain, uh, you can see the hippocampus, the parahippocampal gyrus and the retrospinal cortex. Now, let us talk about interacting with objects. Now, we have seen how movement actually within an environment can facilitate uh, or influence perception. One of the most salient movements we actually perform is when we reach out and grasp objects. You know, say for example, if there is a cup here, reach out to the cup and I pick up the cup to drink from it. An important uh, aspect about uh, reaching and grasping behavior is this concept of affordances. Again, uh, uh, you might uh, want to uh, revise the lecture on uh, uh, Gibson's ecological approach of perception uh, because that is what Gibson had already talked about. So, what are affordances? Affordances are basically uh, things that a particular object renders or offers you. Say, for example, if there is a ball which does not have any edges, you might want to pick the ball itself. If there is an object which has a handle, you might want to pick that object by that handle. Or say for example, if there is an object which is uh, which has a plain surface and affords sitting, you might sit on that as well. You will see people doing this kind of behavior all around yourselves. Why are they able to do that? Because they understand that this object affords this kind of action. A lot of times you will see that if you do not find a hammer or if you do not find a screwdriver, you might use uh, unconventional tools to hammer in a nail or to open and try and uh, try and open a particular screw. So, why are we able to do this? Because we understand that objects have particular affordances, that objects can be interacted with in a particular manner and in that sense we are kind, kind of always prepared to use this information in our interaction with these objects. Uh, so, this basically could imply that perception of an object then not only includes uh, information about physical properties such as shape, size, color and orientation, uh, it also uh, might enable the person to recognize the object, but our perception also includes information about how this object has to be interacted with or how this object has to be used. One of the very interesting studies about affordances was done by Glenn Humphreys and uh, Jane Riddock uh, and they basically uh, were studying a patient named MP and this uh, patient MP had a damage to his temporal lobe uh, and this damage to the temporal lobe had led to his uh, you know led to an impaired ability to remember uh, you know to name objects. So, this person would not be able to name an object if you show him. Okay. So, uh, MP uh, was uh, during this course of this study, it was given two kinds of cues. One of the cues would be the name of the object and the other cue would be the use of the object. Say for example, I could tell him that this is a cup or I could tell him that this is an object that I can drink from. Okay. And then uh, what will be done is he will be shown 10 or 15 different kinds of objects and it is told to press the key as soon as one of the already shown object is presented. It was found that MP identified the object more uh, accurately and more rapidly when the cue given referred to the function of the object. So, it seems that they basically concluded that MP was using the information about use of that particular object or affordance of that particular object in recognizing the object and not really just the name of the object. It tells you something important, it tells you uh, that uh, you know there are 
these uh, very specific ways in which we interact with these objects and these specific ways help us store these objects in a much better way in our uh, you know semantic memory in our knowledge of the world uh, you know so to speak now how is uh, i mean we'll try and uh, link this to uh, how the brain helps us in uh, interacting with the environment and uh, this basically uh, was explored in a very interesting study by younger leader and mishkin uh, what they did was they wanted to study a monkey's ability to identify a particular object or to determine a particular object's location so Angulidri and Mishkin presented a monkey with uh, two tasks. One of the tasks was an object discrimination problem and the other tasks was a uh, uh, landmark discrimination problem. Uh, in the object discrimination problem, the monkey was shown one uh, object, say for example a rectangular solid and then was presented with two choice tasks. So he was uh, presented with the object that the monkey has already been shown and uh, another stimulus that he had to differentiate this object from. Now, it, the monkey was supposed to push aside the target object and then he would get some reward that was placed under this target object. So, you can see the setup is something like this. Uh, so, the target object could be rectangle and the stimulus object could be the uh, triangle and if the monkey successfully you know moves aside the, the rectangle which is the target object then the monkey will uh, you know get the food as the reward. The other kind of task was uh, that the monkeys basically had to move uh, the food well cover that is closer to a tall cylinder. So, you will see here uh, there are two kinds of covers, uh, one of them contains food, but the monkey has to identify the cover that is closer to the cylinder because that is where the food will be filled in. So, the monkey has to what basically do is uh, determine the position of the object because the identity of the two objects is pretty much the same. Uh, behavioral experiments with uh, these monkeys basically showed that object discrimination problem was particularly difficult for monkeys. Uh, now, the second, uh, so I will just kind of go back and I will tell you that the second phase of this experiment was the ablation of the monkey's brain and the ablation of monkey's brain was basically in uh, one set of the monkeys the temporal lobes were removed, in other set of the monkeys the parietal lobes were removed. So, this was the second uh, important part and then when the behavioral testing was done it was found that object discrimination became an important, uh, became a very difficult task for monkeys who had got their temporal lobes removed. Now, on the basis of these results, uh, it was implied that the pathway that reaches the temporal lobes is basically the pathway that is uh, responsible for object identification. So, the temporal lobes in that sense can be implicated in identification of objects. Ungerleder and Mishkin basically called this pathway starting from the striate cortex in the occipital lobes as the what pathway. Monkeys who had their parietal lobes removed had difficulty solving the landmark discrimination problem. Now, this indicated that the pathway leading to the parietal lobe is responsible for determining an object's location. Ungerleder and Mishkin called this pathway leading from the striate cortex to the parietal lobe as the where pathway. So, this is the pathway which is telling them the spatial location of objects. The other pathway, the what pathway is basically telling them what these objects are. Uh, remember that you will need both these kinds of information if you really want to navigate successfully with the environment. Uh, here you can see the dorsal and the ventral pathways, the where pathway is the dorsal pathway and the ventral pathway is the uh, what pathway. Okay. Uh, so, in a simple task of actually reaching and grasping a cup, one could assume that the what pathway would be involved in the initial perception of the cup and the where pathway will tell you that where the cup is and how much my hand uh, should move away from my body in order to be able to grasp uh, the cup and drink from it. So, in that sense we are kind of using information from both these sources and we are kind of integrating this information in order to successfully interact with this object that is the cup on my coffee table. Uh, now, we kind of uh, try and summarize whatever we have learned with respect to these uh, approaches. So, we have seen that Gibson's approach was basically pushing for perception for action while David Marr was more concerned about perception for recognition. Both of these approaches are uh, you know uh, more or less correct in their own way, but you have to try and integrate both of these approaches, the findings and the perspectives from both of these approaches to understand perception as a whole cognitive function. 
it seems that in some way the idea of both these ventral and dorsal pathways can of echo the similar idea. So, the dorsal pathway is the perception for action kind of pathway and while the ventral pathway is the perception for recognition kind of pathway that David Marr was talking about. So, while these two streams may seem uh, slightly different from each other and independent from each other, uh, I am sure you would appreciate that if you have only one of these informations, you will not be able to successfully interact with the environment. So, we necessarily and uh, you know uh, definitely needs information from both of these pathways in order to understand and navigate the environment uh, successfully. So, Gibson's approach of affordances emphasizes that we might need to detect what things are for rather than what they actually are. So, affordances are linked to actions and to the dorsal stream, uh, basically that uh, appears to be ideally suited for providing that kind of information. Also, if you remember, we saw that Gibson said that there is no role of memory in perception and as such the dorsal stream anyways has very little stro storage and so this also confirms that the dorsal pathway works pretty much as uh, Gibson was assuming. In contrast, if you see the ventral stream appears to be ideally suited to the role of or, uh, recognizing objects. So, it is specialized in analyzing the kind of fine detail that David Marr was concerned with, the textures and the gradients and those kind of things and this information will be used in discriminating between objects. Also, as it seems that you know we draw on our existing knowledge to understand and identify objects and uh, so the dorsal, the ventral stream basically uh, kind of is drawing from that source as well. It is also the ventral stream is also slower than the dorsal stream which is conducive to the fact that no immediate action is required. So, if I say for example, throw a you know chalk towards uh, somebody who is not really uh, looking at me, the first thing that you will do is you will kind of grasp the chalk irrespective of recognizing whether it is a chalk or uh, you know a pointed object or something very light. Okay, because that information will automatically require immediate action and in that sense the dorsal pathway will be the one which will be uh, required to act. So, to address these different kind of concerns and these two slightly uh, you know different sources of information, Norman and Neiser in 1994 suggested what is called the dual processing approach. So, they said that there appears to be evidence that ventral stream is primarily concerned with recognition while the dorsal stream is primarily concerned with visual behavior. The ventral stream as it said and as it has been found has been found to be generally better at processing fine detail while the dorsal system is uh, more suited to processing motion. The ventral system is knowledge based and uses stored uh, representations from memory while the dorsal system appears to have only very short term storage that is required to act and you know uh, finish a particular task. Uh, also the dorsal system re uh, receives information much faster than the ventral system and we are much more conscious of the ventral than the dorsal system. Again, if you uh, take the example of somebody throwing a chalk at you or something uh, that you have not seen, you will see that the ventral system does not uh, require that kind of processing, it first needs to take evasive action. So, it has been suggested on the basis of these things that the ventral stream recognizes objects and is object centered in its approach while the dorsal stream is action oriented and it receives a viewer centered frame of reference. Okay. So, uh, it, uh, moving slightly further, so Norman kind of tries and you know defines the two as synergistic systems, basically working in an interconnected rather than an independent fashion. Bursted and Carlton, they provided an illustration of the interaction between ventral and dorsal streams when people are learning uh, you know a new tasks. So, the work of Fitz uh, shows that in the early stages of learning a skill, when you are not really aware of what uh, ha has to happen, say for example, if you are just learning uh, driving of a car, uh, you will just first get uh, you know very familiar with the consoles of the car, the, uh, the gear and the you know other pedals and those kind of things. In that part, you are kind of you know using the ventral system a bit more. Once the skill is uh, formalized, once you get uh, you know acquainted with a particular skill, then what you might uh, shift on to is a highly practiced uh, skill wherein uh, the dorsal stream might be more useful. So, you are kind of just doing things for action. Say for example, after you have learned driving a car uh, you know uh, for a particular amount of time, then you are not really always looking at what the gear uh, is and where the pedals are. You already know that they are there and they have to serve this function and whenever you need to change the gears, your hand automatically goes on to the gears and you can change the gears in order to move forward. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, the end uh, of uh, this uh, uh, link between perception and action. We tried it looked at uh, different aspects of how uh, 
our movement in the environment uh, you know facilitates or uh, helps out our action and also how say for example information from the objects uh, can help us uh, modulate or influence our interaction with the environment thank you